William, welcome to Waterstones, first of all. Thank you very much. Um, Lovely to be here. The Poetry Pharmacy has been a huge hit, and it's been a bit of a surprise hit for you. Were you expecting people to take that book to their hearts quite so much? No, everything really about the Poetry Pharmacy has happened by mistake, which is one <laughs> of the sort of most delightful elements to it, because I spent most of my life being an editor uh, and a publisher and a selector of poetry, but I've never um, really put myself the other side of the fence to write about it. Mm. And um, the whole concept of the pharmacy happened a bit by mistake, because I was asked to a literary festival many years ago, and this was an idea that my friend Jenny Dyson came up with, and I thought I'd only do it for an hour or so, and, and it kind of took off. Then I found myself sitting next to a um, literary agent at a, at a dinner, and I told her about it, and she said, there's a book in this. And it's sort of, so it's all sort of slightly happened by accident. And in that serendipitous way about accidents, um, that just makes it uh, more and more intriguing and delightful, actually. The, the sequel, The Poetry yes. Pharmacy Returns, available in this lovely blue jacket, um, brings back, obviously, the same idea. And I was really interested by one of the things you were saying in it, which was that in a, sort of an increasingly secular age, that there is something about people needing that comfort which they might have got from the liturgy in the past or the sort of the ritual of going to church at the, the weekend and now that poetry maybe can can fill that void in people's lives yes and it's really interesting i don't know if you've noticed this at waterstones but, but poetry sales are booming you mm. know they're up 50 percent over the last three or four years and i think in part that's because of this and it's also because of social media like instagram so it's a chance for people to share with each other um, the right words for how they feel, uh, for succour, support, help, advice, whatever. And um, as you rightly pointed out, in a previous generation, people would, might be doing that on a Sunday mm. um, as part of the ritual of church going and you know, reading the liturgy together and uh, shared prayers and so forth. Often, you know, of course, back older days where people were reading the Latin Mass, it's words that they, they found deeply comforting, but they may not have even understood. Mm. But in some strange way, that uh, shared experience around a text um, was um, deeply rooting and gave them a sense of the continuity of life. And of course, in our secular life, we don't have that. You know, very few people now go to church on a Sunday or a mosque or a synagogue or wh whatever is their faith. And so I think um, there's, there's it's no accident that people are looking for the spiritual, the meditative, um, other forms of sharing, gathering, um, and in a way separating themselves from the, the drudge of the day. Mm. Some people, I think, traditionally have been put off poetry because they feel like they don't understand it. Yeah. You, you've spoken in the past about how you connected with poetry when you were quite young at school. I actually was taught poetry really badly, and so I think for many years I found it something that I held at a distance. Again, in both books, I was really interested to see where you were drawing the poetry from, because it's not just from the old sources that people might imagine. You have found poetry in all sorts of places, haven't you? Yes, because I think poetry is all around us. We're very big on poetry in our culture. Mm. Um, other cultures are too, but particularly our culture. And of course, it's our greatest cultural export to the world, if you think about mm. it, our language, the language of Shakespeare and so forth. And poets traditionally have struggled to make a living. Um, it's not easy, and particularly in the modern world. Mm. And so poets end up being copywriters for advertising or jingle writers for the radio. Um, there's poetry in all kinds of song lyrics. People will tell you that Bob Dylan, Van Morrison, Leonard Cohen, all these you know, great, great poet songwriters of the, of the 60s onwards. Um, so yes, I think poetry is everywhere. And of course, classically, um, in, in, in the first book, I, I put in those the lyrics of You'll Never Walk Alone, which is chanted at Anfield. And we all know that at an England rugby match, you'll hear everyone chanting William Blake's Jerusalem. So um, they may not be aware of it being poetic uh, or it being poetry. And sometimes that's a relief because, as you said, the P word slightly puts you off mm. because of school. And um, I think that that's one of the great tragedies for, for someone like me who's trying to get poetry out there that a lot of people have been put off because they think it's a back of a bookshop, slim mm. volume, dusty elite thing, 
that's impenetrable. Yeah, you mentioned there a football terrace. Anybody who's spent any time on a football terrace will know that some of the cleverest, funniest, wittiest lyrics ever written yes. come up on a football terrace. Indeed. They're brilliant places to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about National Poetry Day as well, which is something that you started. Yeah. I wondered, first of all, what was your motivation for creating a day like that? What were you hoping to do? So I started just before Poetry Day by starting a thing called the Forward Poetry Prizes. Mm -hmm. And they came about because uh, at the time, which was the late 80s, beginning of the 90s, the only time po poetry hit the headlines was about the bickering poets in the poetry society who were about to lose their freehold or lease or something on a beautiful building in Earl's Court. And it was very hard to find anyone celebrating poetry, caring about it or being positive about it. And I found a copy, or I was given a copy, a second-hand copy of the Guinness Book of Poetry from 1958-59, and it turned out that Brian Moyen, the poet, was a member of the Guinness family, and he'd persuaded the Guinness family to sponsor a prize called the Guinness, and with it he made an anthology of the best entries. And in it were, this is the night train crossing the border, um, one of the highly commended poems was Philip Larkin's The Wits and Weddings. It wasn't a winner that year. Um, you know, there was some amazing stuff in it. And what was so interesting was there was young Seamus Heaney and Ted Hughes. There was Tom Gunn. There were all these people whose names I'd got to know later on as a schoolboy. And, and many poems I'd had to learn, of, learn at school. But they'd all been published in the same year. And I'd never sort of thought of poetry like that. I thought, this is brilliant. Anyway, cut a long story short, book comes out, everyone who comes across it says, this is great. But a number of people said to me, the thing is, I, 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 you know, it's all very well, I don't know how to read poetry, I'm still a bit mm. frightened of it. And so I came up with the idea for Poetry Day because I thought that that would take away people's inhibitions and make people feel that they could turn to their loved one and say, shall I compare thee, or whatever it may be. Over the time that the National Poetry Day has been running, you must have seen that the poetry landscape has changed dramatically and that we have a new generation of young poets working in all sorts of mediums and presenting what seems to me to be one of the most diverse pools of talent. That must make you feel quite proud. It's incredibly exciting. <laughs> and again, I think that's thanks to social media mm. because up until then, the poetry world was kind of constrained and controlled by a small bunch of poetry editors for the main poetry publishers. And on the whole, they were white, middle-aged, middle-class men. Mm. And they, they had a limited taste. You know, they, they, they know what they like, and there may be some variety in that, but it's still going to inhibit. Uh, just as in the old days, there used to be the Oxford poets, and then this big moment when I was a kid, when Brian Patton and, you know, all the Liverpool voices mm. came out, and suddenly there was this whole new way. Neil Astley was the man who really changed contemporary poetry, because with Blood Axe, he, he, he added a whole new kind of voice, and published a lot more women poets than anyone had before. So he really opened the door to this newness and published three, I think, massive anthologies, uh, Staying Alive and so on, which, which still, to me, are, are, are my faves. Um, but Instagram's allowed a whole new generation of young people to circumvent these middle-aged editors. And as a result, you know, you suddenly have Rupi Kaur or so on, who, who, who put herself on Instagram, and she's now probably the most successful poet of all time, mm. but in the reverse, in the sense that the poetry publisher came to them afterwards, uh, came to her afterwards and thought, if you've got that many followers, we better do a book. <laughs> so that's what's so exciting now. It's now being led by the poets rather than by the editors or the publishers, and that's healthy. Well, they have you to thank in, in some small part. So thank you for, for National Poetry Day, thank you for the Poetry Pharmacy, and thank you for telling me a little bit more about both. My great pleasure.